What's up everyone? I'm here with episode one of Coffee with Crit. Coffee with Crit, Crit with Coffee, I'm not sure just yet, but we're here at Common Grounds in Oakland, New Jersey. I'm gonna be with Mike Coletta. We're gonna be talking critical care and we're also gonna be talking a little bit about coffee. Stay tuned. This is our inaugural episode, and I'm so glad to welcome a good friend of mine, Dr. Mike Coletta. What's up, How's man? How's it going? How are you? Good, man. It has been a long time since we hung out together. Yeah. Those of you who don't know Mike, Mike is just one of those people. He is just a smart doctor, great resuscitationist, and also just a hilarious guy to be around. He's the master of voices, right? He can do any impersonation. Can you do Biden? Can't do Joe Biden. But like Joe, I've forgotten how to do it. Very good. <laughs> can you do the other guy? Can I do Donald Trump? Maybe not as good as Shane Gillis, but I definitely have the best one in my hospital. <laughs> he kept us in stitches when he was a resident over at the hospital. And today what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be going through a case and it's an interesting case that Mike brought to my attention and we're gonna talk our way through. Ready to go, Mike? Yeah, let's do it. So talk to me a little bit about what you got. So this case was not only fun to, to take on as a, an attending, but it was also the saving grace because I, I was in the midst of talking to a patient that was really just chatting my ear off. And in comes EMS rolling in with a guy who looks pretty sick. So he goes into our resuscitation room. And the first thing I do is take a story from EMS. And what the paramedics are telling me is that they got a call for a 66-year-old gentleman who was ultra mental status. They arrived there and family states that he just hasn't been acting like himself all day. They mentioned that he is an alcoholic. Unfortunately, this gentleman drinks a lot of alcoholic drinks per day. He's been away for a couple of years and now he's just not acting like himself. Paramedics start with getting vital signs on him and they find that his glucose is actually 20. They give him 250 cc's of D10, reassess his sugar, it's now 180. But the family also adds in this small tidbit that earlier in the day he had been vomiting blood. We arrive to the emergency department and comes into the resuscitation bay. And the first thing I do is assess him and try to introduce myself and see if he can tell me anything. He looks to be a little bit older than stated age. He looks a little bit malnourished, but he's not jaundiced. He doesn't have any considerate, uh, considerable ascites. I try to talk to him. I address him by his name and he looks at me. He opens his mouth when I ask him to. But other than that, he's not really following any commands flopping around the room, looking a little bit encephalopathic. Let me hold you there because I think it's important for those that are still in training, or there's quite a few people on here that are. What are the things that when someone's rolling by, you said he looked pretty sick. What are the subtle things, the intangibles, if you will, that, that make you think I need to be in that room now and the back pain for three years can wait? The most obvious is the fact that there are three paramedics, five EMTs, and a bunch of people with a bunch of machines rolling into your <laughs> resuscitation room. Other than that, it was really just his pallor. The guy looked gray. The guy looked like he was just a chronically ill person. And he otherwise just didn't look like a very healthy person. I, I walked into the room just to see what was going on. Now, when you go and you approach a patient, what are your initial before the vitals and the nurses are getting the blood pressure cuff on, the pulse ox on? What are some of the subtle things that you're looking for to see whether or not that person is just sick? Is it like their conversational tone? their rate of breathing, what are the things that you're looking at? I know it sounds a little bit cheesy and we go through this all the time with like oral boards, but really I am looking at what is the, the vibe in the room? What am I seeing? What am I smelling? What am I hearing? What am I just looking at? I stand at the foot of the patient and I just, I listen to what the EMS is, is saying as the report, but as they're telling me, I'm just looking at how the patient is responding to that. Are they sitting up flipping through their phone or are they obtunded? Are they encephalopathic? And that's the first thing I'm looking at is just their general appearance and how they behaving in that moment. The next thing I do is I assess vital signs. I take a look at their respiratory rate. If they're very tachypnic, but they're also like tripoding or working really hard to breathe, perhaps this is predominantly a respiratory problem. If they are tachypnic, but they're encephalopathic and they're obtunded, perhaps we're dealing with DKA or some sort of uh, acidosis. And so those types of gestalt type assessments that I do is really where I begin. Yeah. And then I move to vital signs. That's a great point that it's really the how aware the person is of their situation is one of the first things. Like you said, if someone's coming in, they're feeling very comfortable in their environment or they just look like they're doing their day-to-day -day activities, it just puts a breath of comfortability, if you will, into the situation. But when someone's not aware of the situation, of what they're in, they're looking away, they're not making eye contact with the conversation, it does start to give you that vibe that something's up. One of the things that I do, and I do it badly, is I try to make a joke when I come in the room, and you can tell just based on their response or their family's response, just how terrible the situation is. Now, obviously, I'm not joking if the person's up time and drooling, but if I'm unsure, 
just cracking a self-deprecating joke on myself sometimes can lighten the situation up or it could tell you this person didn't respond the way I thought they would then something else is going on their cognition is off if they don't yeah. laugh at one of my jokes they clearly have a head injury <laughs> right because <laughs> you're the funniest man in the room so what happened after this so you got the what did the vital sign pop up as so the first vital signs came from medics and this is what they reported to me is that the guy had a, a good blood pressure and good heart rate and I asked them a little bit more details the basic oh the systolic 120 heart rate of 75 the glucose did come up to 180 after they rechecked it, so that was good. His respiratory rate was a little bit high, something like 24, I think they told me. But otherwise, they didn't provide too many other details from the vital science standpoint. It was pretty blanket, good vital signs. I took my own. But as we were trying to get the room ready, real life happens, and sometimes the vital signs don't get done immediately in the order that you want them to be done. But I start with my examination, and the guy is encephalopathic. His pupils are approximately 3 millimeters. They're reactive to light, and he does open them when I ask him his name. He opens his mouth when I ask him to open his mouth, and I don't see any trauma. I don't see any blood. I don't really see anything too concerning on his facial features. His heart rate is actually pretty normal. It's in the 60s to 70s based on my auscultation. It seems pretty normal. And his respiratory drive, he's a little bit tachypnic, but I don't hear any rails or ronchi. His respiratory status otherwise seems okay. He's not in any distress. Belly soft, doesn't have any tensocytes, doesn't have any ecchymosis, really nothing too concerning there. Same with the extremities. They look a little bit frail, look a little bit malnourished, maybe a little bit of pallor throughout his body, but his cap refill seems to be okay. And yeah. I examine his back, I don't see any trauma. So really I'm just dealing with a guy who has relatively decent vital signs and then doesn't have any evidence of trauma. He's just acting odd, had a low sugar. So again, is he cold? Is he warm and well perfused distally? Yes. Total body, I would say maybe not as perfused, yeah. but I couldn't tell in that moment, is this just a guy who's malnourished, dehydrated, or is this a guy who's in shock? Yeah, I usually grab the feet when I walk in the room as I'm introducing myself. I just lift the covers up, feel their feet. I tell them why I'm feeling their feet so I don't think I'm some weirdo who just walked in just to, with a foot fetish. But I, I do think it's important. It's one of the first things you can figure out if they're cold and clamped down and they're shocky, it tells me certain differentials. If they're warm and they're shocky, it tells me other differentials like distributive shock. So after I take the initial history and gain what I can from the patient, which isn't much, I asked the nurses to obtain an EKG, establish two large bore IVs, given that the guy had a history of alcohol abuse and it was reportedly vomiting blood. As for two large bore IVs, I asked them to obtain a set of vital signs and I go to the computer to go put in order so that they can get that started. I get called back to the room very shortly afterwards because the patient's vital signs are now coming and he's starting to break it down. Mm -hmm. He's on the monitor and he goes from a heart rate of 75, which I established while I was in the room the first time, now down to a heart rate of 35. And it looked sinus at 75? It was sinus, okay. sinus rhythm at approximately 35 beats per minute. Oh, so what, it was sinus and then sinus, but sinus at 30. Sinus rhythm at 75 beats a minute, and yeah. then he slows down to sinus at 30. Check a blood pressure, and it's reading 60 over 38. So this guy is now hypotensive and bradycardic, which is complicated because you would expect a hypotension to have a reflex of tachycardia if this mm -hmm. was a normal situation. However, he braided down. Are you tying it together with the hypoglycemia that he first had? Any sort of like ingestion? Yeah, so really the differential kind of gets a little bit broad in the beginning, as most cases do, whereas he had no history of diabetes and he wasn't known to be taking any insulin or any type of diabetes medications that could drop his sugar. So that kind of ruled that out. It could be sepsis, right? He could have some sort of stress on the body that's demanding more glucose. It could just be that he hasn't been eating, he's malnourished, he has no glycogen stores because he has hepatic disease, and he could be hypoglycemic for that reason. It could be from his GI bleed, it could be from sepsis, it could be from a number of things. And at this point, the bradycardia, the hypotension, the, the low glucose, it throws a bit of a wrench into it, but at this point, I just jump into resuscitation yeah. mode. Anything with beta blocker toxicity that you're thinking about? I didn't have time to do yeah. a jar chart check on okay. him. He wasn't, I didn't have a med list either. Gotcha. And so unfortunately these real life situations, sure. I don't always get the med list. I sure. don't always get to do the chart check. It, could, it certainly could be. With beta blocker overdoses, you definitely will see low blood pressure and low heart rate. However, calcium channel blockers typically will have a little bit of hyperglycemia. Mm -hmm. So hypoglycemia was a little bit less likely for calcium mm -hmm. channel blocker overdoses, but both of those are going through your mind. Sure. All right, so what's next? So next is start resuscitation yeah. mode. I do have two large bore IVs, so that's good. I ask my ED pharmacist to make me some push dose epinephrine. And I get that started and I give him 30 mics out the gate just to try to get his blood pressure up. I grab my ultrasound. I feel it's got a good strong femoral pulse, but I can't really feel too much in the way of radial pulses. And then this starts to go back into my mind of horrible cases I've had in the past of an aortic dissection. I've had patients before who present with altermental status who I can't really control and then I find out they're dissecting and 
So if I can't feel radial pulses and I do have a good femoral pulse, that's also where my mind is going. So I grab the ultrasound and I put it on his heart. He's got a slightly diminished ejection fraction, but I don't see any large pericardial effusion and I don't see any focal wall motion abnormalities. So I'm thinking maybe it's less likely a heart attack, maybe it's less likely cardiac ischemia, maybe less likely aortic dissection, but I will need more testing in order to figure that out. But he does respond well to the push dose epinephrine. Okay. After 30 mics, his heart rate goes back up into the 70s and his blood pressure is really not responding too well, but I, had, I do have a good strong femoral pulse. So I know he's perfusing his body in some capacity. And during this, what's his mental status? Is he it's it's dropping trash. and then coming up? Does it get better <laughs> with trash. the push? Yeah, his mental status yeah. is going down. Okay. And now we're bagging him because we don't feel like he can protect yeah. his airway. I do get started to prepare for RSI and also prepare for central venous axis. I'm in a hospital that does have residents. And so I do have a couple extra hands in the room. I do call for my one resident to get prepared for intubation. I call for my other resident to start preparing for central venous axis. When deciding how I'm going to prepare him for intubation, Currently, I'm assuming that he's in hemorrhagic shock or septic shock or some other form of shock. And so I need to get him ready so that he, I don't have a bad outcome with this intubation. So part of that is with the push dose epi that I gave him. 30 mics of epinephrine did get his heart rate and his blood pressure slightly improved. And I do now have a liter of LR on a pressure bag trying to get him, trying to fill the tank as best as I can. The medications that I decided to use was ketamine and rocuronium. The why those the why those meds? Because the debate between rocuronium and succinylcholine is so simple and it's never debated and we never talk about it. Just kidding. No, <laughs> I didn't know his potassium at the sure. time and I knew that rocuronium was my safest med to go to. And so I ordered one mg per keg of rocuronium and I decided ketamine as an induction agent. Yeah. It has a longer sedation effect and atomidate and it will also help his heart rate and his blood pressure, I'm assuming, in that moment that I'll probably get a little bit better perfusion and a little bit better RSI with ketamine than I would with Atomidate or other induction agents. So you're resuscitating them before you intubate. That's like the new RSI, right? Or RBI, they call it. Resuscitate before you intubate. And as you're doing that, you're calling for your medications and you're making sure your team knows that intubation is about to happen, but we're not rushing to put the tube until you get him a little bit more chemotherapy stable. Is that right? Exactly. Oh, yeah. That being said, I also don't want to wait too long on this gentleman right. as he is starting to decompensate quite quickly. But if I intubate him too quickly, I'm worried that I'll put him into a really t tough situation with positive pressure ventilation and a guy who has no preload and a guy whose heart is already struggling. It's a balance of when's the right yeah, time sure. to intubate. Currently, I'm bagging him okay and I can get his SpO2 up to 100%. So as long as I can bag him, I'm okay. And for those of you who don't know the literature between behind post-intubation hypotension cardiac arrest, like one in four people who we intubate will experience, emergency intubations will experience post-intubation hypotension. And anywhere between one to 3% of those people will actually go into cardiac arrest. So it's a high stakes maneuver here when you're intubating somebody who's this sick. And that's why resuscitation beforehand is so important because of the high risk of decompensation. Uh, do you use shock index at all to predict which patients are sicker? Sometimes it's just the gestalt tells you, but. A lot of the time it's gestalt. Shock index is not a very complicated yeah. equation. However, I'm not always doing that math in my head. I really am just looking at the patient. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't take much for a guy like this to tell you that he's in trouble and a world to hurt. So, although his shock index is a little tough with the bradycardia and the hypotension spare. at the same time, since his heart rate is really not that high. So the shock index might not calculate like correctly. So, yeah, that's fair. That's fair to know. And that's why good clinical sense always trumps any, that's not a cue for you to do an impression. That's, it, it basically just goes beyond whatever numbers you're looking at. The patient tells you the story most yeah. of the time. Now, what point are you at? You're ready to intubate him? So I'm ready to intubate him. And my resident has his video laryngoscopy set up with a 7.5 tube. And my other resident is starting to prepare for central venous access. We do get the intubation actually pretty well. First pass success was good. He had good visualization with VL and I see no blood in the oropharynx. We get the ET tube in and then my resident starts to place a central line. When we get venous return, it's very watery and it watery. looks very thin. And huh. so at this point, I'm thinking that his hemoglobin and his hematocrit are quite low. Gotcha. And you're sure you're in the vessel, right? It's not I the lymphatic tissue or something. Yeah, yeah. So we're doing ultrasound guided central venous access and we know I'm, I know I'm in a vein. I'm not getting any type of arterial pulse tile return. That being said, this guy is very hypotensive and I have been fooled before, but the blood comes back very watery, very thin. And so I'm very worried that this guy's hemoglobin and hematocrit are quite low. And that tells you when you see blood that's thin, it tells you that process has been going on for some time, right? They're retaining water, they're trying to compensate for their low blood volume, but it's watery versus an acute GI bleed or acute trauma where the blood looks like blood, but yeah. the total volume is out. 
And it's my favorite call from the GI doc when they say, what's the hemoglobin? It's like, it'll lag. I don't know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> right. Bleeding. They should know better. Exactly. And then when you cycled the blood pressure, was he, did he become hypotensive? Did you have to do a post intubation interventions or? So I'd already started him on a norepinephrine drip okay. at this he point. So he there. was already on a norepinephrine drip getting fluids, but I do call for two units of emergent blood from my blood bank gotcha. when I see his blood come back. I do receive a phone call from the lab at this point with a critical value. His hemoglobin as expected is yeah. low. It's 4.4 with a hematocrit of 18. It wasn't until a little bit later that they called me with his chemistry values, but at this point, I am assuming hemorrhagic shock, it's hemoglobin, and the history of vomiting blood. So that's why I have two units of blood ordered, and those are gonna start running through his peripheral lines because central line is not really a great way to get blood in quickly. He's got two 18s, and so that's really my choice. Yeah. I'm gonna throw a unit of blood in each one. Now, let me ask you before we go too far, this whole episode is called Coffee and Crit. I should ask you what your drink and say, what's your drug of choice. My drug of choice is a uh, cafe au lait, which is my understanding is just coffee with warm steamy milk, but it sounds more fancy than coffee with steamed milk. Yeah, whenever you say something in French, it sounds fancy. Yeah, it sounds like you're just trying to be very arrogant and elitist, but that's okay. I just drink an Americano, four shots of espresso. All right, go ahead. The hypoglycemia piece I haven't figured out yet. His okay. blood glucose has remained relatively okay. stable while in the emergency department. I've done two Aki checks. They've been okay. And when his chemistry panel did come back, his glucose was 200. Okay. So at least I've corrected that. Okay. I still don't know why it dropped, but his chemistry panel does come back as well as his ABG. I did an ABG as opposed to a VBG because I, I did, he's now intubated. I did want to know if there was any type of hypoxemia that I wasn't able to see with poor perfusion on his pulse oximeter, but his oxygenation is fine. That's a great point I want to point out to people because sometimes we rely too much on the pulse ox and you don't know the pitfalls of the pulse ox. You already mentioned hypotension shock, decreased distal perfusion, also nail polish is like a acrylic nail polish can also be full positive. And new literature, newer literature, is just actually skin color, right? You can overestimate someone's pulse oximeter, patients who are black, but also anyone with high melatonin content can be fooled. If you're in doubt, even though I'm a big proponent of not doing ABGs, but if there's any doubt at all, you need to know what the oxygenation is, go ahead and get that gas. And then from then on, try to correlate it with the pulse ox. I did get an ABG. His pH is less than 6.8, his bicarb is less than 10, his lactic acid is undetectably high, but hey, his sodium and his glucose are okay, so oh, we're fine, Frank, <laughs> right. we're done. <laughs> it's um, a medicine. Yeah, but this guy is just profoundly sick. Once I got his pH back at 6.8, the next steps I took was to give him an amp of bicarb, which I know is a band-aid, but it might help, and I increased his respiratory rate and his tidal volume. The respiratory therapist had picked a standard 350 tidal volume with a respiratory rate of 16, which was just not gonna cut it for this guy. He needed to increase his minute ventilation, and the only ways that I could do that was to increase his tidal volume and to increase his respiratory rate. So I increased his respiratory rate to 24, and he looked to be about six foot tall, so I increased his tidal volume to 500. Off the top of my head, I don't know the tidal volume charts, but I feel like 500 is probably sufficient for eight cc's per kg for this guy's ideal body weight. And so I sent him up to 500 at tidal volume, respiratory rate of 24, and I'm just trying to blow off as much carbon dioxide as I can. Did you have a chest x-ray on him? Did you show any? I didn't get a chest okay. x-ray done until after the subclavian line was in, gotcha. the ET tube, and the OG were in. <laughs> That's fair. Sometimes I'll even push somebody who has severe metabolic acidosis, and they have no signs of having interstitial disease of their lungs. I'll even push our tidal volume up to 10 cc's if I know it's gonna blow off CO2 and there are trials that show that's safe. Any thought of a bicarb drip at this point or just the bicarb pushes? A bicarb drip was later started, okay. but in that moment, sure. the bestest thing I have was a bicarb push. Sure, and there's, even though I'm not suggesting crystalloids for a person like this person needs blood products, if you do have somebody who is, uh, has a big metabolic acidosis, I've started using isotonic bicarb boluses. You just take basically water, give them three amps in there, and bolus is through. Josh Farkas on Pone Grip talks about that a lot. But basically, you're giving them an isotonic bolus of bicarbonate. That's something I started doing instead of the drips, and I found it works very well. But again, not this person who you're going to dilute them even more and cause hypocoagulation. But anyway, you were saying? You no, know, thankfully, I had blood products going yeah. uh, at the same time as a bolus of LR. So I'm trying to do as much as I can to give him preload and to give him his blood products back. The other thing that I had got phone call about was his platelets were 70. And I assume that's probably from his hepatic disease or maybe thrombocytopenia chronic illness. But with platelets of 70, I felt like I could hold off on platelets for now. It was, I deemed it to be okay. However, his central line starts to get a little leaky around the edges and I think that he may be coagulopathic. Right. So one unit of platelets was later ordered on this patient. It sounds like you wouldn't have been wrong if he had gone with a one-to-one -one transition without knowing any more about him with the platelets being that low. Maybe he was just pancytopenic from some other process that was going on. It sounds like a, but in the moments, right? You just try to replace what you can. 
Exactly. In yeah. the moment, this guy is still so undifferentiated. It's a let's just throw, let's just in an intelligent way, throw yeah. things at him, right? He needs blood products. We know he needs blood products. We know he needs platelets. I know he needs bicarb. I know he needed glucose, right? I still don't have one unifying diagnosis for this uh, patient, but I do know that he needs resuscitation. So the next steps is to try to get a little bit more information on this guy. I'm finally able to step aside and let chest x-ray give me a picture. I know that the central line is in a good place. I know that the ET tube is a good place. And I know that the OG tube is now in his stomach. I did decide with the history of GI bleeding or history of vomiting blood, I take a little bit of water and I lavage the ET tube and I don't really get too much blood back. So I think that I'm maybe in an okay state where I'm not actively pouring blood out of his esophagus. But I do have the suspicion that this is all likely related to an upper GI bleed. Perhaps his glucose is from the stress of the situation and low glycogen stores that now he's hypoglycemic because he's in such a stressed state. Perhaps he's in hemorrhagic shock and that's why my blood pressure is low. Perhaps in the moment he's not perfusing the SA node and so now he starts to braid down. Perhaps he's just so profoundly anemic and so profoundly in shock that's why I'm seeing what I'm seeing. And so I made the decision to call GI. I let them know that I have a patient here who seems to be in hemorrhagic shock with a history of vomiting blood, known to be cirrhotic, likely has varices, and I think he needs to be scoped. And let me guess, they got their cars, raced right over to the hospital yeah. and scoped the patient. They said, oh, thank you so much for calling me at this hour. I would love to come in. Nothing would make me happier than doing my job. No, I got a, oh, why don't you just resuscitate them first and then we'll scope them on my day. Oh, he was on the spectrum, this patient, yeah. right? He was on the too sick to scope. And if you did too good of a job, you would have been too stable to scope. Yeah, right? yeah. Urgent. I love how these studies seem to be done in order to cater to the consultants. Oh, this study shows that they do better when on Mondays at 10 o'clock. That's when the patients really have the best outcomes. It's all GI. They didn't feel particularly inspired to come in just yet. But at that point, I also decided to bring in a little extra help. And so I call my critical care consultants. Still being undifferentiated, I did decide to obtain a CT scan of the head. And I've also decided to obtain a CT angios to take a look for active blush or any active sure. hemorrhage where if GI is going to not take this patient, do I need IR to do an embolic? Yeah. So the CT scan of his head comes back fine. I don't see any active hemorrhage in the brain, which is a good thing. The CT angio of the abdomen and pelvis did show likely varices, Ooh. no considerable blush, no, no severe active hemorrhage. Right. And so the decision was made at this point to just continue with resuscitative efforts and hope that GI can come in soon to a scope the patient. Had you gotten any history from family or anyone else about the history of varices or? So I didn't get any family history. The okay. family still wasn't in the emergency department and patient health, fortunately now can't give me anything at yeah. all because he's intubated. Right. But I did have the opportunity to go back into his chart and I saw that he was back in the hospital a couple months ago with an upper GI bleed. He did have known varices and GI did scope him before. Okay. And so I was feeling, feeling pretty confident at this point that I knew what was the driving force for this patient's illness was. Gotcha. That it was likely an upper GI bleed from a varices. So now you have a guy who's hypotensive, who's intubated on pressures, getting blood back. At what point do you start to think, as an emergency medicine physician or resuscitationist, at what point do you start to think that you're going to start pulling out balloons and putting them into esophaguses and stomachs? When does that thought to start to cross your mind? When staffing finally gets one ordered and I have oh. one left in my hospital. Oh, gosh. Now, so the Blakemore tube is uh, something that I admittedly, I've not done much, but let's say I'm in a situation where I don't, like GI either, I don't have GI consultants and I need to transfer or if I'm in a hospital where GI is not gonna be in for a while or they're just flat out refusing to come in, yeah. I would consider putting in a Blakemore if this patient is now requiring multiple units of blood transfusion, FFP, cryo, platelets, and I'm just using, I'm emptying the blood bank in order just to continue right. to fill a hole that just continues to leak, I would place a Blakemore at that point. Yeah, it's one of those skills that for anyone who's watching this has lost track of or has never really seen one done, I definitely recommend that you watch a video on it. I'll link something in the show notes that you can watch, but it's one of those things that you probably do once a year in a busy center, maybe once every few years if you're not, but it's something you got to know like the back of your hand because you need to know where it is also in your department. That's, That's the other, another big thing. Right? You got to know where it is. You can't find it if no one's ever. Yeah. So. No. It's very important to make sure like nurse manager knows where it is yep. to make sure that your head tech knows where it is because you're too busy to go run to the supply closet and grab this while yeah. you're like the main person resuscitating. You got to have somebody else who knows where it is and knows what it's called. Exactly. <laughs> you say the thing with the Blakemore, they're like, I don't know what we've never used one before. It's like it's well, a big balloon. <laughs> Just look for a big <laughs> balloon. I find that and pacers and the pacing box. What else are things like the football? Hub? I'm just giving you all the things that I find that like people don't know where they are. 
But that's why I like to do a walkthrough usually at the beginning of my shift if I have a minute or two, just to make sure I know where everything is. I know where the where our mechanical CPR device is. I know where the helmet is. I know where the Blakemore tube is. I know where the pacemaker Just because in those moments, I don't want to send the tech who's been there for two days searching around. I need to tell them I need to go to this room and look underneath this shelf. Please. Even simple things. Like the other day, I had a hard time getting someone to find me a cautery pen. Yeah. I was like, it's that little pen with the hot tip on it. They're like, yeah. oh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and people always get mad. Like the residents, they'll, they'll often get mad at the staff that they didn't know. I was like, do you know where it is? And yeah. they're like, no. I'm like, you should be equally mad at yourself because you should know your room very well. Exactly. It's also incumbent upon us to know where the supplies are because exactly. if somebody's a new hire, you can't expect them to know exactly. where it is. And so just give them a little bit of direction. Say exactly. it's a very, it's that long balloon. Looks yep. like this. It should be in this closet on the top shelf if you don't mind grabbing it for me. Yeah. should say this word on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. So how'd the case wrap up? So he did end up getting admitted yeah. to the ICU and didn't get an endoscopy until the next morning, obviously. But GI did scope him, found two bleeding varices and banded. So two bands on the varices ended up doing well. I think in totality, he received five units of pectoral blood cells, one unit, of three units of platelets, two FFP, two cryo. He's currently still in the ICU. He's intubated, but he's following commands. His lactic acid is now completely resolved. His acidosis has resolved. He seems to be doing well, and I think he might walk out of here. That's awesome. Yeah. So just take it top to bottom. There's a guy who came in with severe encephalopathy, severe hypoglycemia, hypotension, bradycardia, GI bleed, Metabolic acidosis. Did he have kidney injury? Did he bump his? He had a slight AKI. Okay. He's got that going <laughs> slight for him. AKI. Slight AKI. And, uh, and basically, just with resuscitation alone, this guy was able to pull through. So it sounds like most of his stuff was driven by the fact that he was hyperperfused. And the hypoglycemia could very well have been <laughs> secondary to the fact that maybe he was a little adrenally insufficient. More likely than not, he was probably just didn't have glycogen stores. And then his stress states just utilized all his glucose. Does that sound right? Yeah, this guy was pretty emaciated and malnourished, so he had no yeah. muscles, he had no liver. I yeah. just don't think he had the glycogen stores, and I think the stress, the stressed state of a GI bleed just causes his glucose to drop. And I think medics leaned into, oh, this guy's hypoglycemic, I'll give him dextrose and he'll sure. get better. But really, there was so much more nuance to this case, and there was a lot more that needed to be addressed. I think that, honestly, the glucose may have been the least of his problem. Yeah, I got to tell you, now that I've seen many patients with cirrhosis, I have a healthy respect for just how hypoglycemic they can come, just by the fact that they have no glycogen stores to, to make new glucose. It's definitely brought in my differential for someone being coming with hypoglycemia. But that's not always diabetes. It's not always sepsis. Sometimes you just have to keep a continuous infusion going because they don't have any metabolic reserve for that. And once they pull through, they start eating, obviously they'll start catching up. And that's one thing I try to stress to my residents is respect hypoglycemia. There has to be a reason for it. Yeah. If someone is a patient who takes insulin, they didn't eat lunch, they forgot, and sure. then they got hypoglycemic, you give them a sandwich, you give them a little dextrose, they get better, they feel good. Maybe that person can go home. Right. But the person who doesn't have any history of diabetes and is now with a fever and has a hypoglycemia, you're not just giving them sugar and sending them home. You got to figure out what's going on. Absolutely. I had an attending during residency. Mike Hoxstein, I'll never forget. He used to catch us all the time. I think he planted patients, to be honest with you, but we'd have patients who come in with hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, and he'd always ask us after we presented, did you check the feet? And they're like, I check the feet. Lips. He goes, you didn't check a diabetic's foot? What are you doing? And he'd take right. the socks off, and lo and behold, there'd be this gigantic ulcer yeah. that was fungating, whatever. So that's where it's coming from. Yeah. I, I swear he planted the same patient every time on shift. But the point is, is that you have to aggressively look for a reason. It's not enough yeah. just to say, yeah, they're hypoglycemic. It's a bad thing. And it, he, unless you can identify exactly what it is, you have to search aggressively. And sometimes that means putting them on the hospital service to let them declare themselves that they're not going to be hypoglycemic again until they find a cause. Exactly. Especially if it's the weekend or this is somebody who's a little bit unreliable for follow-up. Yeah. You definitely don't want to send that person home and have a bad outcome. Yeah, by themselves or with a caregiver that isn't aware of that. That could be a recipe for badness. All right, man, any closing thoughts on this case? No, it was a fun resuscitation. These are the types of cases that, you know, although you, you don't want to see patients have any bad outcomes and you don't want to see patients be sick, it also is what the driving force for what excites us about our job. Yeah. It was okay. fun. And what I like about this case is that the obvious answer wasn't immediately clear to you, but you knew the things that you needed to handle as you're searching for a diagnosis. And I've said it time and time again on, on lectures and podcasts that many times you don't know why the person's coming in. They're not always gonna have the Foley with pus coming through from the nursing home that tells you it is. But what you do know how to do is stabilize a patient while you're sitting out your diagnostic test. Don't be frustrated if you can't find the diagnosis on the first lap around. Yeah. But 
be frustrated if you can't resuscitate a person and make them better because sometimes those things take time. Yeah, and I tell patients all the time is our best diagnostic test. Sometimes we just need to see the case go through maybe an hour or two to, for it to declare itself. Sometimes patients, they, get, they come in a little early and it's undifferentiated at the time. But as time goes on, patients tend to declare themselves and then you get a better picture and you can figure out how to best to help them. Said. All right, Mike, it was great to see you. Yeah, you too, man. All right, take care.